Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. In the 60s and 70s and 80s, Control Data Corporation was a major force in the mainframe market. It was well known for being the first supercomputing architecture. It was used extensively in defense and uh, in uh, scientific and compute uh, intensive applications. And therefore, I believe it was about time we started to talk about this amazing architecture here in the Mushix mainframe channel as well. What better way to talk about the Control Data Corporation mainframes than by talking to somebody who actually works on Control Data and is probably one of the top five or ten experts in running emulated Control Data Corporation environments, operating system environments. And so out of the blue, a couple of weeks ago, this gentleman, Kevin Jordan, reached out to me and asked to connect his mainframe to one of my mainframes. Um, and turned out that his mainframe is a Control Data Corporation mainframe. And, uh, and, uh, and so we did and we connected and, uh, and then I reached out and I asked to find out more about CDC and if it was okay to have to interview Kevin and, and, and let let the expert talk and, and tell us a little bit more about uh, this uh, this amazing architecture that was one of the top computer companies out there in the 70s and 80s, 60s, 70s and 80s, Control Data Corporation. And Kevin is certainly an expert in the in the field, having been having worked there himself. So, uh, Kevin, I we are very happy to have you join our channel and, and be willing to talk about the Control Data Corporation uh, computers and and operating system and architecture. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, can you tell us a little bit how you came to the CDC architecture? You know, most people were tending either to towards IBM. Uh, computers or VAX computers, but you ended up with CDC. How did that come about? Yeah, I uh, went to uh, undergraduate school in Western Massachusetts um, at a small college very near the flagship campus of the University of Massachusetts. Um, and the university's uh, computer center was based on control data mainframes. So uh, they, were, they were a strong control data customer. Uh, back in this in the, in the 1970s, uh, so I, 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 as a student, learned to uh, you know program in various languages on on the CDC machines, uh, and then you know uh, went to work as an intern in in that university computing center. Uh, went to graduate school at the University of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and of course continued to work in the computing center as a as a graduate student, uh, and then actually was hired by the the university uh, to be a you know professional helping to develop software for for that mainframe um, or set of mainframes actually there was a, a cluster of, of those con control data mainframes there uh, and I worked at the university for uh, for about ten years before uh, joining Control Data um, while working at the university the university was also very active in the Control Data users group it was a mm -hmm. A group called VIM, um, where the, 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 as a, an acronym VIM, V I M, was a kind of a derived from the uh, from Roman numerals, meaning you know V I six and M thousand six thousand, which is a yep. an homage to the Control Data six thousand series mainframes. Um, so we, we were active in the in the user group, and I through that met uh, you know quite a few people that were that were. Uh, you know, employees of control data, uh, marketing people, technical people, and so on. And uh, and, and basically at one point I uh, was, uh, you know, given an offer I couldn't refuse. So I moved <laughs> from uh, Western Massachusetts to the, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul metro area in, uh, in Minnesota, where I worked for control data for, again, about about 10 years before, before moving on from there. Oh, that's interesting. And... and you know, I found out during our our email exchanges to connect your mainframe that we're seeing here in the picture, your CDC Cyber 865 to my um, IBM mainframe, uh, that you actually wrote the package uh, for the NJE protocol uh, for for the CDC operating system. 
Uh, yeah, was, well, what I did was, so c Control Data um, had a package, an NJE package for the mainframe, mm. but, it, but it wasn't well, it wasn't designed to, to connect to BitNet. So there were some shortcomings with respect to trying to interoperate with you know, IBM mainframes that, in the academic community that were connected to, to BitNet. So, mm. so what we did was, or what I did was, uh, was modify that software so that it, it played much more nicely with, with uh, the you know IBM systems that were uh, you know that were used to host BitNet uh, really. So I wouldn't say I, I implemented that package per se, but modified it so that it played nicely with BitNet. I see. And then and then those modifications were adopted by Control Data and made part of the standard standard software that they distributed to others. Now what we did develop at at, at the University of Massachusetts was. A, uh, a mail, you know, email solution that ran on the mainframes um, that then used the BitNet, the NJE interface, um, to actually exchange email and bulk data and so on. So what we did build was the, the email solution that, that leveraged BitNet for, I see. For, for sending email. And we distributed that email solution to many universities around the world, uh, particularly in Europe uh, and in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, basically, just about any university back then that wanted to, that was based on control data equipment and wanted to mm -hmm. connect to BitNet or Earn or Net North would use our, our software to do yep. that. And do you remember uh, who you were connecting to in BitNet, who your, your, your first outside node was, your, your first outside yeah, peer? Right. As I recall, the first outside node was the University of Connecticut. Okay, so I have a list here of of uh, of the nodes on Bitnet and in the early '80s, and yeah, I just found it. So, uh, City State U was the node of the um, of the Connecticut State University system, and it says here it was running VMS. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, it, I don't recall that part. Yeah, we. So that the uh, we had two nodes, that nodes within the University of Massachusetts. There was the one that we managed, um, which was called UMass, and then there was another node called UMass VM. Yeah. So there, there was, the engineering school had a IBM forty three forty one, as I recall, yeah. running VM CMS, and we actually connected the control data mainframe to our, you know. Uh, our nearby neighbor within the university on that VM system, and they, as I recall, were connected to. The no. Yeah, I guess because they had the RSCS plates probably yep. uh, nicely with uh, with VMS. And yeah, I just found yeah. both nodes. Uh, this is this is amazing to me that you know, 35 years later, uh, people yeah. remember the nodes. And yes, U UMass VM was the VMSP node, and yep. UMass was your machine that was running NOS. It says here. Anyways, yeah. so that's yeah. uh, and so once and and then once um, CDC put this into the standard operating system, it was just there for people to use, and you were still maintaining it, or were they maintaining it at that point? Yeah, well, it was there. It was it was a an optional sort of add-on product that that uh, the customers could could license to run mm. on their mainframe. So it wasn't you know it wasn't a Standard part. It didn't. If you licensed the operating system, you did not automatically get the NJD software. It was just a, it was an option you needed to add. But, but yeah, yeah. The, the the basic data communication component, the NJE protocol support, was maintained by Control Data. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the the mail, the email package, yeah, um, was we UMass. You know, we UMass continued to manage that and distribute it around the world. No. Yeah. That's that's uh, very interesting that we can still find all this uh, uh, this 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 data here on the old uh, Bitnet list. And can you uh, tell us a little bit more how big those machines were? The CDC, how many users would typically be running on such a machine? Yeah, so at at, at UMass we had um, we had we had a collection. We had we had at one point as many as four of those mainframes in the machine room. Oh wow. So, so we had we had a uh, like on this you know on this page you can see a two control data mainframes listed there the 865 and the 175 and the, those represent um, two hardware generations so mm -hmm. they were um, both of those machines were the top of the line for their period of time in history 
We had a Cyber 175 at the University of Massachusetts, and then we had the 1.3 smaller systems. Uh, at, at peak times, um, the Cyber 175 could have as many as 200 concurrent users oh, wow. running on it, uh, interactive, you know, time-sharing users, mm -hmm. plus, you know, a, a large number of batch jobs all running concurrently. Yeah. And, and the smaller machine might have uh, as many as 100 uh, users running concurrently. So, I, you know, if I remember correctly, uh, we could have almost, you know, as many as 300 concurrent users uh, distributed across those two machines. Yep. Um, and those, would, you know, those would be students, you know, during, um, you know, maybe toward the end of a semester when a lot of programming projects were due, uh, that's when we would see that kind of peak usage. Yep. So 200 um, time-sharing users, if we're talking about VM, that would be probably be a, I want to say, a, a, at that time, you know, during during those years would be an IBM 3083 BX maybe that kind of machine that those were meant to run about 200 or so mm -hmm. probably 200 too too big for a 4381 um, but just to let our viewers get a little bit of a comparison uh, what the, what that means 200 online users I, IBM obviously always was a little bit more resource intensive for time sharing users mm -hmm. especially on MVS than uh, than CDC and VAX was yeah, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about the the architecture of the CDC? Yeah, it, it was a uh, classified as a sixty bit machine. I can I can put up some details here of the Cyber ones, of the eight sixty five, for example. So it was uh, the word size was sixty bits. It's a word addressable machine. Mm -hmm. um, the the address width was eighteen bits. Um, but you know what was available to a single user program was about 17 bits of address space, so about 128k words, 60k words uh, was as large as a as a program, single program could be. Yeah. Um, the machine, uh, you know, this this machine, the 865, could have a very well for a period of time a very large physical uh, with CDZ with all uh, central memory, uh, the terminology in IBM would be storage, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically. So. Uh, yeah, so this, this machine really has a, a million words of, of physical RAM mm -hmm. uh, on it. Um, so the, the, the operating system could address uh, that much or potentially more. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was a concept of uh, extended memory. So you can see here that it, it says there were 2 million words of ESM on this particular machine, yep. that, its configuration. So yep. that was like, you can think of ESM as being like a RAM disk. Um, yeah. So it was it was actually uh, attached to the CPU via high speed kind of a, a hardware linkage. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very high speed in terms of millions of, of uh, words yep. per second transfer rates. Um, and uh, and then uh, the, one of the interesting things about this architecture is that there could be as many as two CPUs, so two 60 bit CPUs. On a on a single machine, but those could be uh, conceptually surrounded by as many as twenty peripheral processors. Wow! Um, and wow. these weren't these weren't boxes and these weren't machines and in, you know in, in, in separate boxes. They were all part of the same uh, you know the, the same packaging. Yeah. So you can see in the photo here, perhaps in the back. Exactly. Around, is, yes. Is, one of these machines. So that was a machine that, in the background, I can tell from the shape of it that that machine had two CPUs and <laughs> probably 20 peripheral processors. Yep. The peripheral processors were 12 bit machines. So if you're familiar with like a PDP 8, like a DEC PDP 8, you know, vaguely similar to mm -hmm. that in terms mm -hmm. of uh, being a 12 bit machine uh, with uh, up to 4K words of, of memory each. Mm -hmm. But these machines, these peripheral processors, had had full access to this central memory of the okay. CPUs, yep. and actually most of the operating system on these machines ran in those peripheral processors. Oh, so okay. there was a small, very small kernel, relatively small kernel that would run in the in the CPU. Mm -hmm. But most operating system functions, that, you know, as programs are running, as they're as they're requesting I/O, as they're you know requesting other kind of uh, 
interaction with, with resources on the system through the operating system, most of, most of those requests would be satisfied by the peripheral processors. Yep. Uh, so like, as, I, as I said, the operating system was uh, mostly running in the, in the PPs and, and the name of the operating system, NOS, the, the acronym, yes. stands for Network Operating System because it was, you know, these machines were viewed as a tightly coupled network of, of computers. Right. Um, and as I said, you know, so, so the, since most of the operating system was running in these PPs, you know, literally various uh, elements of the operating system would be running truly in parallel because, uh, yeah. you know, um, because of the fact that they were, it was literally distributed across potentially as many as 20 of these peripheral processors. Yeah, that's fascinating. So that, that kind of shows us how different this architecture yeah. was from the IBM architecture. Well, of course, IBM architecture also had IO processors, which is so, something different than this. Yeah. Um, this, uh, yeah. this shows that it had real processors taken off uh, workload yeah. from the main processors. And I think, yeah. the, if you know, from my limited understanding, this kind of comes also from the fact that as you said, this is a 60-bit architecture, which points to um, compute-intensive workloads because 60 bits obviously is, is great for math precision, um, yeah. whereas IBM, of course, uh, wasn't really pointing that much of math precision. In the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s, most computers were 36-bit, A38-bit processes because of math precision, because math was so important. And we've seen in a previous video that I released on this channel that some Soviet mainframes in, in the 60s were 70-bit uh, processes because they were almost exclusively oriented at math problems. And so, uh, you could, so the architecture is kind of built to let numeric intensive application run freely on the processes, on the main processes, and then have the those 12-bit um, peripheral processes process as much as possible um, that's related to the operating system and the I.O. workload, I guess. Yeah, yeah, basically offloaded most of the operating system work into the peripheral processors. And, and in addition, um, so the, the peripheral processors uh, manage I.O., so they communicate across high-speed channels with, mm -hmm. with controllers. Mm -hmm. And those controllers were also intelligent. In of course. They, they ran, you know, they were basically small mini computers as well. Mm -hmm. um, so even disk controllers and, uh, you know, and tape controllers and so on were, were intelligent controllers. Yep. And then, of course, uh, CDZ also had something very similar to IBM's 3705 yep. you know, front end yep. uh, data communication controllers. And uh, yep. CDZ had those as well. They called them 2550 NPUs or network yep. processors. For yeah, for managing yeah. lines, communication yeah. lines. Yeah, and as you said, the the, the sixty bit word here. Um, so single precision floating point uh, was was had a forty bit forty eight bit mantissa and a twelve bit exponent. So mm. so single precision on these machines had <laughs> was essentially equivalent to double precision on an IBM mainframe. Yes, but also had a larger magnitude because it was. a uh, well, effectively, eleven-bit exponent as opposed to uh, seven or eight. Seven, bit, yeah. You find on the, yeah. the IBM machine, yeah. Yeah, and so, and, and what was the double precision? Ninety-six bits. So it's basically yeah, exactly you know two forty-eight-bit mantises concatenated together. Yeah. It was yeah. two. A double precision would be two sixty-bit words. Um, yeah. Where, where the, the you know the, the least significant forty-eight bits can, were were, were uh, the mantissa and uh, and double precision. You, concatenated two of those together yeah so i mean this is quite this is quite astonishing in the 60s you had uh a 96 bit mantissa on floating point operations which i think was probably unparalleled uh at that time i mean i don't know of any other architecture with that kind of precision yeah, oh, yeah. and in the, in the, in the, the architecture also had a very interesting instruction called population count which <laughs> uh, was re reputed to be um Created to suit the uh, intelligence community, so mm -hmm. it was a it was a special instruction that just counted the number of bits that were won in a sixty bit word and returned that <laughs> returned that value. Uh -huh. So for, what, for whatever reason, uh, whatever encryption was going on, uh, you know, in, in, yeah. in the NSA and CIA benefited enormously from that population count instruction. Right. 
in, in addition to having the, the much uh, greater precision and flow. And so in a such distributed computing architecture, I think distributed is the right word here, mm -hmm. how would, would an assembler programmer then get about go about uh, writing uh, yeah. code? So the high end, yeah, the high end machines, so the, the lower end models uh, of these machines were were typical, what you might call sequential um, instruction machines. So if you looked at an assembly language program, you saw the instructions there, they would execute, you know, sequentially as, as you would expect, you know, on, on most uh, computer systems. But on the high-end machines, like this 865 and the 175, and their original predecessor, the Control Data 6600 machine, mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the, the CPU was divided into multiple, what were called functional units that mm -hmm. operated also in parallel. So there would be, um, I think, two floating point functional units, uh, there would be there were functional units for doing uh, integer arithmetic, Boolean operations, uh, you know, fetching uh, operands from memory, storing results in memory. Those, those functional units all operated in, in parallel. And so, so uh, you know, a, a skilled assembly language programmer on these machines would think in terms of, uh, of of having multiple threads of execution through their program, and they would they would interleave instructions in in an assembly language program in order to try to keep as many of those functional units busy mm -hmm. in parallel as, as 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 possible. And the and the compilers, especially let's say the Fortran compiler, was also uh, you know built to be aware of that capability yes. and, would, and would automatically generate that same same kind of code. Yeah. Um, there were there were and there were there were customers. Um, one of one of the national labs, uh, the, which which one it was escapes me at the moment. But one of the national labs developed a very um, very popular special arithmetic library for the, the machines because, in addition to that parallelism going on, the machine had a, a the high end machines had a special. <clears throat> Um, what we call it, uh, instruction stack internally. You can think mm. of it now as, as kind of a cache, you know, a yep. very high speed cache in a way. And so, um, if you if you if you had a a loop in your program yes. uh, that was small enough to fit in that stack, then then potentially the machine would would not have to go to central memory to to get you know any data, which would only slow things down. Of so course. Speed. And so it's, I think it was, was it Lawrence Livermore Lab maybe developed this library, one, one of the national labs, um, developed a library that, that, that leveraged, you know, all that knowledge of that, how that stack worked plus the, the parallel functional units and, and created some typical arithmetic functions that would run on these machines, on these Cyber 175 or 865, you know, even f potentially faster than on a larger supercomputer. Oh, wow. Wow. Like a control data also had a, a, a model of machine called a 7600. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which was very similar to the, the 865 and 175, but with some significant differences as well. Um, uh, uh, but was it was, you know, the next generation of supercomputer after the yes. 6000 series was the 7000 series. And then and that yeah. was also de designed you know, by, by Seymour Cray. Yes. Um, yeah. And that, the 7000 series was, uh, the, was the series that, that Seymour uh, designed uh, just before. It was the last uh, series he designed for control data just before uh, de yeah. departing to create, create yeah. research. The 7600 was released in 67, we see here. And uh, it looks like, you know, when it, it, sa it says here, units sold 75 plus. Uh, yeah. Which looks like a very low number, but these were extremely expensive machines. Obviously, they, they were very expensive machines and physically quite large uh, yes. as well. And very, the, and these machines, the the seventy six hundred and the sixty six hundred, for example, they were actually from a interior designer's point of view, just gorgeous machines to look at. They had mahogany exteriors with smoked blue glass. Yes. Um, Yes. They were just very pleasing to the eye. Yes. Look at as well. Yeah. Yeah. We're looking at one yeah. right now at a picture, serial number one. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. If, if, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're spending, uh, you know, let's say ten million dollars on a computer, uh, you might expect to have some a a aesthetics uh, as well. Yeah, which Seymour Cray obviously carried forward into the Cray uh, yeah. uh, computers as well. Yeah. Right. And, and can you tell us a little bit, uh, Kevin, about the operating system that ran on uh, this machine? Was this batch? Uh, you said it was time sharing and batch, but how yeah. how does this how how was this working? Yeah, it, it, um, it, it's basically there's not a large distinction between batch and time sharing. I mean, time sharing obviously you're you're interacting with machines through a terminal, but it's not that there was a, a special subsystem called batch on the machines. That's sort of like it wasn't a special thing like Juns 2 on, on MVS. Yeah, just, kind of yeah. like VMS more or Unix. Yeah, just, yeah, exactly. Just built into the into the capability of the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, so so it it, it it did time sharing quite quite well. Um, and again, part of part of the uh, success might be might have been based on this idea that. The 20 peripheral processors that were offloading much of the work of the machine. So, so you could have, uh, you know, multiple jobs being swapped in or swapped out truly in parallel. Mm -hmm. it, when you were when you were configuring these machines, um, I guess I guess you know the common theme here is parallelism. You, starting yes. from from the the internal design of the CPU, and things are in parallel, and then uh, you know you, you think in terms of, of Parallel programming, in a, in a sense, if you're running for the assembly language, especially. Yes. But then, but then you're also as a as a maintainer of of one of these mainframes, you're also aware of uh, all the parallelism that can occur in terms of I/O. So you're in deciding in deciding how to attach, you know, disk drives to the system, or uh, you know, or tape drives, or just about anything else. You uh, you know you. You, you're very cognizant of of um, of trying to spread the the uh, you know the disk drives across uh, multiple channels and controllers. Yes. And then and then and then most you know with, you know most controllers could have uh, two channels attached to them, so you always had a you know two possible paths to a controller, and mm -hmm. then from a controller. Controller can control, you know, up to uh, I don't know, in eight or more disk drives, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when you're when you're configuring the machine, you you would you would always you know, try to think in terms of um, always having, you know, an available path to an I/O device so yes. that yeah. under peak loads the machine could perform very well. Yeah. And so for time sharing, uh, you know, it worked nicely. As I said, you know, during peak times, we, we would have as many as 200 concurrent time sharing users mm -hmm. you know, um, interacting with the machine and getting reasonable response time from it. Yeah. So, and, and of course, you know, one thing here is to mention, you know, when when younger viewers today, they, they see our videos here on the Moshix mainframe channel, when they think of time sharing, uh, it's not like people were doing a lot of productivity work like editing documents or spreadsheets. I think in those days, um, time sharing meant m mostly, for first and foremost, developing code and running code, right? Those were developers. They weren't, they weren't doing time sharing to send that, you know, emails were, I guess, was part of it, but it wasn't for product, office productivity. It was for development work, right? Correct. And at the university, you know, this was all about teaching students how to, how to program. So you're exactly right, you know, that when we had those, those peak loads of 200 users, what those users were doing were entering you know, mm -hmm. Pascal programs and compiling them and running them for, for uh, you know, class, pro, you know, assignments. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, you, if if you were lucky, you know, and you had more than two or three compiles available. Um, when I was in college, we had uh, basically just Fortran and Pascal and Assembler, and that's all we could use. And and even you know, some other universities they would have 10, 15, 20 compilers because the professors were kind of more open-minded. But uh, those were really just there for development work. And I guess within your faculty, it was also very numeric intensive work as well. Yeah. Well, and, and these machines, uh, the 865 and the 175 at UMass were um, also supporting you know, professors doing 
you know, doing significant research as well. So there, there was, you know, quite a bit of scientific computing happening on the machines also. We would have batch jobs that might run, you know, days mm -hmm. on, these, on, these, on these machines. Um, yep. I, I don't know what, you know. <laughs> so, yep. Some in interesting things with physics or astronomy or, you know. Uh, yes. And, and, then, and then the social sciences used them as well. So we, there was a, a popular uh, package called SPSS, the of course, uh, statistical package for the social sciences, which I think IBM now owns, but yes, acquired back, by IBM. Back, yeah. Back then, it was uh, Northwestern University uh, or a derivative of them that, that distributed it. So that, uh, that was that was a, a package that was used quite heavily by um, by the social sciences. So so we would have you know students on the machine running um, you know writing Pascal programs because they're learning how to program, and then students in the social sciences and professors. You know, doing interesting things with uh, statistics having to do with census data or, or whatnot. Yeah, and, you know, and CDC every... obviously was also a force in Fortran, right? I mean, I think oh, uh, yes. I, IBM and, and CDC were the two leaders in Fortran compiler technology and, and innovation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Fortran was absolutely, the, you know, was the scientific language of the, of the day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And still, you know, to this day, still is. Fortran yes. is still, still used quite, uh, you know, quite a bit in... Uh, physics and, and uh, oh, astronomy yes. yep. for, for, its, for that. And, and uh, I think, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think also, you know, the complexity of the of the architecture that you just outlined with this interleaving and, and very high degree of parallelism kind of shows that, you know, uh, even in those days already, a good compiler was already better at producing fast running code than, than a good assembler program. I think it's certainly true today because there's so many complex instructions today that they're really, you know, the, a, a good IBM compiler or a good Intel compiler will produce better, uh, you know, faster code than, than a human assembler programmer could. Yeah, well, and, 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 and that, that triggers another thought about these machines. Um, they, they were not called risk machines at mm -hmm. the time. That term, that term hadn't been coined yet. Yes. But, but they were risk machines. These were, mm -hmm. uh, these were not, you know, their instruction sets, I mean, that was, that was a hallmark of Seymour Cray designs. He didn't really believe in complex instruction sets, yeah. and and so the the instruction set of this machine is relatively small compared to uh, you know an IBM mainframe or even a you know a, a deck vax system, for example. Yeah. Um, very you know relatively small and um, but but very well very interesting design of of, of instructions. Um, yeah. And you know and you would have up to four instructions packed into one of these 60-bit words and that's also what helped oh uh, i see you know drive the drive the parallelism oh okay so you so as you were programming you were you know you had this the multiple threads kind of in your mind mm -hmm. uh, you're you're uh, as you're doing the programming but you're but you're also um cognizant of how the instructions you're programming would fit into the words in memory because yes. If you could, if you could fetch four instructions at once in a word, uh, and those and those instructions reference different functional units of the machine, yeah, you know, they would they would distribute uh, more effectively or more efficiently. Yeah, the, the you didn't program. have to go to, on the bus to go get um, uh, exactly. fetch from memory. Yeah. So, can you tell us a little bit? I mean, a lot of the people here on, on this channel are programmers at heart. I, I guess just like you. So, can you can you tell us a little bit how it was to develop software on the CDC, what compilers you had, what kind of environment, how this, how, what was the experience like? Yeah, so this, this, uh, this, this page gives you a feeling for the, the kinds of programming languages that were supported. And just, you know, during just about any programming language you can imagine that was present during that era of the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, were supported on the, these machines. So, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, we had both versions, uh, popular versions of Algol, um, of course. ATL, Basic, COBOL. Compass was the name of the assembly language on the mm -hmm. machine. Mm -hmm. Cybel was a Pascal class of, of, of language that was used uh, by controller as a, mainly as a systems programming language. Mm -hmm. Both Fortran 4 and Fortran 5 or 66 and 77, depending on how you reference them, were, were available. Mm -hmm. uh, Lisp, you know, there were multiple dialogues of Lisp. Uh, these were usually contributed by universities. So, University of Massachusetts had developed a, a, a very popular version of LISP. 
um, University of Texas as well. Um, Pascal, uh, you know, the, the Nicholas Vert uh, version of Pascal, there were a yes. couple of versions of that available. Mm -hmm. PL1, which all the IBM aficionados here should of course. Uh, know very well. Yeah. Um, uh, Snowball was, was uh, another programming language available on the machine. Mm -hmm. um, Simple it was another kind of control data language, but it's a really a derivative of Jovial, which was a programming yes. language uh, very popular in the, in the Air Force and maybe Navy as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there were statistical packages like SPSS was a commercial yep. st st statistical package for the social sciences, mm -hmm. very popular. Um, the the APL that the version of APL that control data distributed to its customers, licensed its customers, was actually developed by the University of Massachusetts. So I I worked on that APL okay. personally, um, and uh, you know the. It was an interesting machine to, to to program on, especially if you know for, for scientific computing, you know, with languages like Fortran and others. You know, it was a very um, you know interesting machine to work on. APL is another example because it was high precision, much higher precision. A single precision on the control data machine was, I think, wider than double precision on on uh, say the IBM mainframes. Yeah, <laughs> IBM mainframes. At the time, had 64-bit floating point, um, yeah, minus so, minus so, one for the sign, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was probably double precision. Yes. So yeah. Yes. Single precision, single precision on the control data machines uh, had a 48-bit mantissa and a 12-bit um, exponent. Mm -hmm. So and then and then it also had double precision. So it had 96-bit. Wow. Uh, as well. So wow. um, So it was used. Uh, you know, university it was popular with universities, but also very popular with uh, you know the CIA and the NSA, of NASA, and so on. Yeah. For its, uh, you know, for its for its floating point <clears throat> prowess. Yeah, ninety six um, bit uh, precision on floating point is huge. I mean, only recently IBM, I think in the year maybe two thousand and four or so, introduced one hundred and twenty eight eight bit wide registers but of course that's not the same as 128 bit precision on the on yeah. the floating point but yeah that's yeah. huge huge and then we're talking yeah. 80s here well 60s this started in 1960s wow yes. mind like the, first, the, the term supercomputer was coined for the control data 6600 computer so that was the the you know the the, the, the first 60 bit mainframe that Seymour mm -hmm. Cray produced while yeah. still like control data Yes, um, and so the data types. Or let's say for, you know most people here would know PL one. What would be a yep. PL one data type be for ninety for that kind of precision? Yeah, I'm not a PL one expert, so I can't. but on Fortran, let's say. Yeah, so on Fortran, you know, single precision again would be you know the forty eight bit. Forty eight um, bit. Yeah. Yeah. And double precision. A double would be. Double. Uh, yeah. Okay. Ninety six. Ninety six. Okay. Ninety six bit. Yeah. Mantissa. Yep. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, and, and then a, pro, a language like APL, which is an interpreted language, again, which didn't have double precision per se, but mm -hmm. single precision still was, you know, high precision yeah, yes, for the of day, course. especially. Yes, of course. Um, so well known for that. And and these were very, very fast machines. I mean, for the day, these were the probably the highest performance machines in the market. Yeah, um, no during doubt. That, during, that, during that period. No doubt. Um, and also, you know, correspondingly um, costly. Yes. <laughs> but... But uh, uh, but what well known for um, scientific computing, kind mm -hmm. of top of the line for scientific computing mm -hmm. at the time. Um, and then you know if, now if you wanted to to do character manipulation, that was a bit tricky on these machines because they were not byte addressable. These are word addressable machines. You know, so no byte. When you when you would fetch or store in memory, you're fetching or storing an entire 60-bit word. <laughs> um, and so character manipulation involved, you know, loading a, a value and shifting and masking. And, yes. So. Yeah. Especially in Fortran, <laughs> that would be kind of hard. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, the, the sort of the native character set, let's say, the, the most heavily used character set on the machine was, was a 6-bit was based. So, Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, sixty-four character. In fact, it was called the called the sixty-four yeah. character set for that reason. Um, but 
um, six bits wide with a 60 bit word, you could pack 10 characters in a word. Yeah. Now, if you, now, you know, especially later in, in life, uh, you know, people really wanted to do something more than just uppercase letters. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so there were other character sets developed. There was a character set, one called, uh, was, was quite frequently used called the 612 character set. And what that referred to was the idea that, um, that uppercase characters and, and digits uh, were, you know, represented in six bits and in lowercase and other special characters with 12 bits. So it's okay. kind of a combination of 612 and then had a concept of uh, an escape character that would let you know. But was it compatible with the Epsidic? Because at the time Epsidic was actually, may, most people think Epsidic was invented by IBM, but actually it was an industry standard. Uh, yeah. And I, actually, IBM wanted wanted not to go Epsidic. They wanted to go ASCII at the beginning, but then they changed later on. Uh, yeah, no, it was <laughs> it was not Epsidic. It was, it was, it was a, you know, basically a, P, a CDC proprietary. I see. Uh, Encoding. Character set. Yeah. So 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 um, no, that was that was uh, so anybody that was doing a, a system level programming would would need to be cognizant of, of the character translations that occurred to mm -hmm. go from representations within the computer to you know what what landed on your on your uh, on your terminal screen yeah or or the reverse you know the, the keyboard translations um yeah so so uh but you so, had libraries i guess for all that right i mean most oh, of yeah there were libraries for all of that exactly and a yeah. lot of that translation was done in front-end computers so like ibm had you know back in that during that time into like the 3705 yes. computers. Mm -hmm. Well, control data had something very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they called uh, the 2550 N NPU as a network processing unit. Yes. Um, so it, so a lot of that kind of character translation was done out at the, at the front end. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the programmer needed to be, you know, kind of cognizant of what was going on as well. Yeah. And then for something like NJE, so the, you know the, the, the subsystem on the control unit machine that that connected us to it, to BitNet, the NJE subsystem had to do uh, basically that that con control data character set conversion between that and Epsidic because NJE. Of course. Even even though the spec says NJE can do or or Bison can do ASCII, um, I don't think <laughs> anyone I don't think anyone ever did. It's always all Epsidic. Okay, yes. So. Yeah. It's all Epsidic. Yep. yep. So uh, again, that, that translation was done in the, in the front end. I see. Okay. Yep. Can you show us a log on here on this on your system? Oh, yeah. Tell us a little yeah. bit what you're running it on, and I guess you don't have a real CDC in your in your cellar. Or in, or in your... No, the CDC is running. Uh, the CDC mainframe is running uh, on a uh, here on a uh, an Apple Mac Mini. <laughs> um, <laughs> And on that, that same Apple Mac Mini has a has an IBM forty three thirty I guess like thirty thirty three running on it and and a Prime ninety five fifty two so oh wow <laughs> and I think and I think all of those virtual machines are probably running at higher performance than the actual hardware did back in of the course day. probably yeah yeah. Um, yeah so so I just logged in interactively uh, and you can see there's this kind of a, a standard banner telling us we're on the NOS operating system. And this would have been like one of the last versions of NOS or? This was the last version of NOS, exactly. Okay, yeah. okay. NOS 287 was the very last version produced in that. And the 871 means this was came out in 1987? No. <laughs> huh. No, this is a, 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 a CDC and, uh, numbering system. So okay. 2.8.7 was, you know, a, Kind of a numbering system that would be familiar to most users of software today, but um, mm -hmm. but the eight seven one eight seven one refers to the it's kind of an internal numbering scheme referring to uh, in a way the iteration of the of the software. Engine. Right. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. Release level eight seventy one. Yeah. Yeah. Means, um, so, yeah. It's kind of a 287 is sort of the external marketing version, and 871 yep. is the internal technical. Version. Exactly. Yeah. Another way to look at it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So so we can so we're logged in now. Um, we can do interesting things. So on the Nostalgia Computing Center site here, we're we're logged into the machine, and and on the on the right side of the the, the web browser screen, you see a number of um, selections we can make to, to run some automated scripts to demonstrate how, how mm -hmm. the machine or how you would interact with the machine. The yes. Computer. So I'll pick one, a simple one like, you know, Fortran. Um, 
and I can say run script. Now what's going to do is create a simple Fortran program to compute. Oh, this is very nice what you've done here. So you you wrote all this yourself, the emulator yep. and the website yep. and everything, right? Well, well, I did not write the the control data mainframe emulator. Uh, a gentleman in, in Australia named Tom Hunter implemented the original control data emulator, which is no small feat, by the way, because yep. in order to, to implement a, a, you know, a high fidelity emulator like this, where you have you know this 60-bit machine plus these 20 peripheral processors, mm -hmm. you know, running it, plus uh, a wide variety of, of uh, emulation of peripheral devices, you know, disk drives, tape drives, all that kind of stuff. That's, that's a pretty, pretty big deal. Oh yeah, that's, that's so, a huge job. Yeah, so, so Tom Hunter is the, the implementer of the, yep. of the emulator. And what's the emulator called? It's called DT Cyber, which stands for Desktop Cyber. Okay. So these were, yeah, so you know, these were called the you know, cyber series, could only have cyber series of mainframe cyber. Yeah. Um, you know, 74 or something, depending upon the, yeah. you know, the generation of hardware. Um, Impressive. The numbers, the numbers are different. So what, what, what I, I have modified or enhanced the emulator mm -hmm. somewhat to, mainly to add to it uh, some additional data communication capability. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the, the out-of-the-box, so to speak, emulator that, that Tom created allows you to log in interactively and certainly supports all of the batch stuff and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but but uh, data communication protocols like HASP and NJE are not supported in the out-of-the-box. So, so I have enhanced uh, the emulator to add uh, HASP and reverse HASP and, uh, and NJE. And, and we use those here on the site to, so not only are, is this machine connected to, you know, uh, MDS and, and VM via NJE, it's also connected to them via HASP. And, and the reason for that is that, or a reason for that is that HASP allows us to submit batch jobs from the control data mainframe to the IBM systems and, and yeah. vice versa. But what we call RGE, uh, RJE, yeah. remote RJE, job RJE, entry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, exactly, RJE, yeah. Yeah, yeah so anyway, I, I just, in this quick demonstration, you just saw a, a Fortran program be entered and then compiled. So using the, what, what the control data called the FTN5, Fortran 5 compiler. Mm -hmm. um, and we also support uh, you know, languages like APL, which if you're familiar with APL, it has its own uh, symbology, you know, its own, of course. own special symbols. And Even terminals, <laughs> special terminals. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I guess, yeah, where I was going was that um, Tom Hunter wrote, implements the basic uh, or the core, you know, control data emulation. I've enhanced it somewhat. And then, and then uh, the what you're seeing here in terms of interacting with the machine, the, the website, the nostalgic community center website, terminal emulation, so on, that's, I've implemented that stuff. Yeah. So that includes uh, this APL emulation. So we can oh, see wow, very switching nice. into the APL character set and, and again, and entering a, uh, an APL function to compute, again, the Fibonacci numbers, but mm -hmm. using the APL character set. Um, very impressive. So what, yeah, so what, an APL is supported that, so the, you know, the Nostalgic Computing Center supports a number of, a variety of machines. Many of them, you know, many of those machines and operating systems have their own versions of APL. Mm -hmm. And of course, IBM, uh, you know, it probably created, I think, uh, well, probably, I mean, IBM created the first version of APL, right? The first implementation of the APL language was kind of invented by Iverson. Iverson. Yes. Now, Iverson, who was a IBM fellow, as I recall. And, yes. Yeah. And there's uh, there's a version of that available to run on Hercules, which I, is on my to-do list to get it running on the IBM emulator. Yeah. By the way, written by the same person who wrote, uh, who is the, so there is, there's a distribution of APL that runs on the um, on on the Hercules emulator, but it's not uh, it's not MVS. It's a previous version MVT. But this, it's done by the same person in uh, Switzerland, Jürgen Winkelmann, who uh, works at the ETH uh, University, and wow. he has both. He has MVS TK4, which of course we all know and love, but much well much less known, but probably even more impressive. He has an APL distribution as well.
Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's important. There's a guy named whose uh, kind of email name on the list is, goes by Fish. Yes. And it, I think he's created a, a VM, or he took that NBT version, I think, and created something that this runs on the yes. VM. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. I was planning to take, trying to see if I could get that up and running as well. Now that's a little trickier because. Um, yeah, I got to get the 3270 emulation. <laughs> but Jurgen has a solution for that using yeah. the Windows terminal emulator. So he has a solution yeah. with the font, so it works. Yeah. But, yeah. but I've implemented a web based 3270 emulation, so I, I would want to of know, course. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, enhance that to include of course. more for the APL character set as well. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. yeah and, you, and you can see here that um, other examples include demonstrate the connectivity between the machines. We, we can submit a batch job, you know, an RJE job mm -hmm. here to the to the MBS system. And that is and now this, uh, we can see it on the right window where Hercules is running. That's executing there. Well, it hasn't submitted it yet. Hercules is doing its thing over there. That's, that is the MBS system on the far right. Oh, ah, okay. It's right still putting the JCL so, together. Yeah. So we're just we're just entering the JCL and source code for the program here, and then it will submit it. Yeah. Um, uh, and then you're running a fourth job because you don't have fourth, I guess, on the NOS. Uh, it's not it's, uh, not fourth. I'm not sure what you're... Because it says here fourth, Fibonacci, exec oh, fourth. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that was Fortran H. Ah, uh, Fortran H. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what we just demonstrated was that we created this job, submitted it using half to the MBS system, and you're looking at the output that has re been returned yeah. to the control data machine. Yeah, RJ. From that MBS yes. system. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and we can do the same to VM. So, v, you know, there's also, uh, we can submit, our, we have an RJE connection to VM. We also have an RJE connection to the uh, Prime, this Prime Super Mini so that are on the site okay. as well. Impressive. Uh, and then, this is probably, we you know, going to be difficult for people to see, but... Yes. Uh, what what's in the middle of the screen here is uh, part of the control data mainframe emulator. This is the console display. So these control data machines, even back in the 1960s, the, the, the operator console for the machine uh, was a, was a pair of of CRTs, uh, vector displays actually, mm -hmm. and one and one of those uh, twenty. PPs uh, was dedicated to driving this display. <laughs> so it, it, even from the very beginning, you know, in 19, uh, mid 1960s, when the first 6000 series supercomputer was released, uh, there was this capability, a very dynamic display. So today, for people that are familiar with Unix, you know, there's there's the top command that shows you kind yeah. of a dynamic display of what's happening. And yes. well, Control Data had this back in the 1960s as part of their uh, supercomputer. So, um, th so this this dedicated processor that's the the operator inter interface basically is refreshing this this pair of CRTs, type of connected CRTs, 30 times a second, oh, wow. and drawing all the characters. It's a vector display, not a you know, not a character display. Yeah. So, so the the um, uh, and, and and so it, because it was re, you know refreshed thirty times a second, it, it allowed for uh, just a very dynamic operator interface. You yeah. Know, it was a GUI, kind of a GUI that was way ahead of its time. Yeah. <laughs> Space Invader was written for it, right? Well, there were a number. Of, yeah, there were a number of there were, there were a number of uh, yeah games that were written. Um, <laughs> That uh, they took advantage of the, of the display. You know, the unfortunate thing, oops, the unfortunate thing, of course, was that that only the operator. You, know, you had to be in front of the operator console. Yes, to, 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 to use this. It wasn't something that the average user was, was able to take advantage yeah. of. But but uh, yeah. the, in fact, I think I do have games on here, so I, I can show you a couple of uh, cute things. I managed to find a screenshot by Tom Hunter of exactly the console. So we can kind of see here, because I put it large on the screen, you can't see it, but our viewers can, so that they can yeah. see kind of, because because it's a little small there. So, but yeah, a game would be fun if you could run it. Yeah, here's a, here's a, uh, here's one of the, Snoopy <laughs> was, was one of the things that you could run on the console. So, 
again, imagine this is this is the 1960s. Yes. And and you, and you had this this animation running on a on a computer. This is just unbelievable, um, unbelievable. I mean, we're talking almost I mean, 50 years ago. Yeah, and then Andy Cap was another one that. What, yeah, what and I'm putting up on the screen for our viewers, yeah. uh, they can see the t the dual scopes, um, yeah. the parallel scopes. So that where this was. Yeah, I'm sure it's hard to see on that screen, but what I'm showing here is so the operator interacted with this by the, the, the left screen. There was what's called the left screen and the right screen, and they would have independent displays. Yes. And and uh, and you address the display. You called up the display by typing. You know, a one character identifier for the display as you know, as the operator, you would type this into. So what I what I am showing here now are on the left screen is the what's called the P display, which stands for a peripheral processor. So you're actually seeing mm. the programs that are popping in and out of the 20 peripheral processor. Now yes. This machine is not not very busy. Mm -hmm. So so you know, most of the peripheral processors are doing nothing. Yeah. But um, but if we submitted a bunch of batch jobs to it, we 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 start seeing um, you know a lot more activity. And how reliable is this uh, emulator? Have you had? I mean, is it, is it does it run it's, reliably? It, it's it, yeah, it's extremely reliable. Yeah, extremely reliable. We, I mean, this software will run on here. Uh, I mean, this operating system will run without intervention much longer than the real thing actually ever did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, the CDC so, machines ran quite hot. It wasn't wasn't it a problem for a while? Um, they were notorious, especially the early ones. Were notorious for being very thin. I mean, remember, this is all uh, well, you know. If you opened up one of these machines, uh, there were these large bays of, of nests of wires. Yeah. And I, re I remember going into the machine room uh, one day because the, the way this worked was usually so. At the University of Massachusetts, we had we had. Uh, a team of customer engineers, what Controller called customer engineers, that that were based on site, and their their job was to keep the machines humming. Yeah. Um, and so usually every morning, early every morning, uh, they had a you know they basically had the machines dedicated to them, and and what they would do is run diagnostics, they would tune the machines, and so on. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, going into work early one morning and expecting to 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 see the the customer engineer that I would you know normally see that time of day and, and he was nowhere to be found. It turns out he was literally inside the computer um, <laughs> adjusting the lengths of wires because he wanted to make it run a little bit faster. So so he would make uh, you know some timing wires a little bit shorter. Yeah. Uh, and the machine would run fast. But if you make them too short, then the machine wouldn't run at all. You know? yeah. so, I, I read this book about the CDC history and there was this uh, mentioned that you could actually walk inside the CPU. Yes. I mean, and we're not talking uh, the computer, the CPU, right? Yes, yes, uh, that's what I'm saying. That this, this, this customer engineer that one morning was literally inside the CPU, inside <laughs> the base. I, that's why I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't find him. He, he, he made some noises and I, I, <laughs> yeah. I thought I discovered where he was. But, um, very impressive. Yeah, very, very, very fascinating machine. And so there are a number of displays, you know, there's a whole, uh, I think there's actually a, uh, there's, there's the left screen here again, you probably can't see it very well, but it's a, it's an index of all of the displays that, that uh, are available to the operator. Mm -hmm. um, so anything you wanted to know about what was going on in the operating system, um, basically you could call up here on, on one display or yeah. another. Any, um, any console from the 70s and 80s for today's, uh, users would see it daunting at first, right? I mean, even for people yeah. who approach a via of an MVS console at the beginning, uh, all in uppercase, it's daunting to, to try to make sense, right? And then, yeah. and then you could have somebody seasoned on, on a, you know, and I mean, I know MVS well, and and then I look at this console and I and I I'm, I don't even know where to look, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I yeah, mean, they're the, the completely you're... different systems. Yeah, but it's interesting though. There are kind of analogs. Um, if you look at this, you can you can equate the especially this right screen that what's called the, the B display. Mm -hmm. It's basically like like P, the PS command output on on Unix or like okay. top like the top command is the, the address space. Um, so JSNs would be address spaces. Um, oh J, no, JSN stands for job sequence name. So ah, okay. basically the 
the four character name, unique name of a job. Okay. Now the ones that you're that you're mostly seeing here, um, except for you see something pop in once in a while. The ones that are kind of stable, yeah. Especially the ones with three letter names. Yeah. Those are those are what Nose calls subsystems. So yeah. They they start they get started when the machine first comes up. They remain running, mm -hmm. you know, until you take it down. Like Jess and, or something on the MBS. Yeah, and, and the one the one you see uh, near near the bottom about. Six up from the bottom is NJF. That's the that's the NJE subsystem. Okay. So that's the software that's for, and then the one just below that is named RBF, which is Remote Batch Facility. So that's RJE. Yeah. Um, and the one below that is PLF. That yep. stands for Tie Line Facility. That's actually reverse that's reverse hash. So that's the inverse of RBF. So oh. RBF is accepting connections from from RJE stations mm -hmm. and, and receiving jobs. And TLF is what allows this mainframe to pretend it's an RJE station. Right, so right. It allows yeah. it to connect out to a, like the IBM host. Yeah. We're looking here yeah. at the screenshot from Tom Hunter, which yeah. doesn't have those. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's clear that we, we see yeah. IAF and we see, we see NAM yeah. by yeah. IO, MAGS. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, and IAF is the interactive facility. So that's yeah. all interactive terminals okay. are, getting, are managed by that one. Yeah. Um, and, and NAM is the network access manager, network access uh, right. method. And, but the, what's called. what's still unclear to me is that only the 6600 or the 6000 had the double scopes, right? Did later mainframes from CDC like the 865, the Cyber 865 no. also have double scopes? or? Well, they, they uh, yes and no. <laughs> So the 6000 series actually literally had two CRT screens that were round. Mm -hmm. um, but but the later series, so the, the 6000 series, then the next generation was the 70 series. Yes. They all had the, the, the console that had literally two CRT scopes. Okay. Now the, the 170 series, which is the next generation, the console had one scope. Yeah. But it was divided in half. So you still had the two displays. I see. All yeah. the software, all the same software run equally well on both kinds of hardware. Oh, okay. Both kinds of console hardware. So real compatible. They were, yes, they're hardware compatible. The, the computer couldn't tell the difference between, you know, that older version of console and the newer one. I see, one, okay. One CRT screen. Oh, that's why it's still running just the same. Okay, got it. Yep, exa exactly. Yep. And even and with the later versions, it was still like a vector graphics? Yeah, those that next generation was still vector graphics. Now later on, toward the end of, of uh, you know the life of these machines, it was also possible to plug in a, just a standard well, <laughs> plug in you could plug in control data as asynchronous terminal. Mm -hmm. They had a you know just a normal ASCII kind of a terminal you could plug in. Yeah, and use that as a console. Okay. But again, what what there were there was software in a in a front end PPU or actually probably in the hardware in front of that, that made that asynchronous terminal appear to the mainframe as if it was one of these older stuff. So it was still compatible. Okay, I got it. It was still, all the software was still compatible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and for the viewers here, so, I mean, you, you know, to do an NG, NJE implementation, you kind of have to know a lot about RSCS, uh, VM RSCS, which by the way, uh, Kevin, a lot of IBMers today will not even know what RSCS is, right? Even though it was <laughs> hugely central to the success yeah. of IBM in the 80s and even to the 90s, today RSCS, they think it's just a printer uh, spooler wow. and that's it. But um, so you would have to know um, RSCS and the implementation of the protocol on the IBM side and how things work on the IBM side because it is very IBM centric, right? Oh, yeah. um, and and then you would also have to know, of course, the CDC side. So you had to learn all this for for writing the NJE protocol, or were you also already the system programmer for the uh, VM machine at the time? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean they were, and even today, there's you know IBM has protocol specs for for NJE. Yes. And you can look at that and see what, you know, what bytes go over the wire, so to mm -hmm. speak. But yeah, you're, but you're absolutely right. You kind of have to understand a little bit about what what happens to the bytes when they get on. And, and on, you were a system programmer on the VM as well at the university, yeah. or? Oh, so yeah, I mean we at the at the at the University Computing Center we did not have um, IBM. 
mainframes. The okay. engineering school had, had the IBM 43. But you had no access to it. I think it was the, the 4341. Right. So the main, the central computing center was control database. We, we managed the control uh, supercomputers. Right. But you, have, the, you, but you had no log on on the VM machine or anything like that? Well, I, per, I personally did not, but certainly plenty of people did. And, okay, okay. And, and, I, and I interacted. I mean, I, I had to interact with the engineer, people at the engineering school to get our of course. control data mainframe connected and, and uh, you know, test the software. Can you tell us what kind of wire you were running between the two machines? Because I guess it wasn't a modem. No, no, it was a direct, it was a direct uh, you know, Sort of hardwired connection, what you might call a leased line, except it was, you know, except it was within the campus. So, yeah. Uh, what what they call these days dark fiber. Yeah. Right. Today they just call dark. There's no protocol on it. There's just a connect physical connection. Correct. Yeah. 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 You know, my kind of main screen here of the nostalgic computing center. You can see that what what we have here is a collection of classic mainframes, but we're also, you know, we're all, we're also bringing back to life all of the data communication networking that was uh, available back in, in those days. So if I, if you look here at, at the Cyber 865, which is what we were just logged into, you can see that there are NJE lines to various machines. Yes. Um, um, and here are the two IBM machines. The 4381 is what's running VM, and the 3033 is running MVS. Yes. And, and I've got both HASP and NJE going to the 3033. So, mm -hmm. so even though I can't send a job to it using NJE, I can do it perfectly well using HASP. Yeah. So using R RJE. Yeah. Similar. So at, there are actually two control data mainframes on the site as well. So in, in addition to that 865, there's a 175. Yes. Um, and not, that just represents, you know, um, the 175 is just an older generation of hardware. It's mm -hmm. the same same operating system as you can see and yep. same functionality. And that one um, similarly is connected to the, the VM system by both NJE and, and HASP. So so we can we can we can submit batch jobs to to uh, to VM to, to CMS batch um, from the 175 using using the RJE protocol yep. on RSCS. Now any any IBM or here on this channel when whenever you you mention and by the way I put here on the on the screen, you can't see it, Kevin, but our viewers can. Uh, the description of the protocol, IBM has good manuals that describe the the job uh, transmission protocol for NJE. Uh, so somebody could just take that and write it in Python or, I don't know, Go or, or C. Um, but uh, what I was going to say is that any mainframer who's on this channel, whenever that we hear file transfer, the first thing we think about in the IBM world is blocking and uh, blocking factors and, uh, yeah. and record size, right? Um, and, yeah. orga and on the organization. Th does NOS have a file system? Does it make all this transparent to you or do you also have to take care of that? Yeah, uh, it does. It, it definitely has a file system. Um, but it is, but it's, much, uh, it's much easier to use, let's say. <laughs> the end user, the programmer does not normally need to be concerned. Very, Aware of blocking factors and record sizes and that kind of thing. Okay. I mean, the the, the, the basic operating system is really it, it, probably uh, you know in many ways similar to a Unix file system, and then it's just a you know a a, a, a sequence of, of yeah well a logical views. view a logical yeah. view yeah yeah now there is something called uh, on the control data the control data works something called um, the record manager. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a there's a layer on top of the basic file system mm -hmm. that that uh, like COBOL and Fortran can use. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it's probably more uh, more COBOLish. Appeal one, I guess. Option yeah. with Fortran. If you want yeah. to use the record manager with Fortran, you, yeah. can, you don't have to. Yeah. Appeal um, one. And it, yeah, and if, with record manager, you can now get in. With that, you can get into yeah more of this concept of uh, block size okay. and whatever. But but it's uh, so, but it's not it's not in your face quite like it is with uh, okay. you know the file system on MBS. Yeah. Now MBS doesn't really have a file system. <laughs> Can you show us uh, between your VM three seventy and your yeah. NOS some traffic? You know, some on yeah, the so so uh, again, I hope this isn't too hard for you to see. But maybe on the VM three seventy uh, ter term emulator, terminal emulator. 
you, you want to see the, the 370? Yeah. Yeah, oh, hold on. Let's do that one. So I can, if I log into uh, 43. Yeah. Again, I really like what you've done here. You just click on the image and then you can, it opens up yep. a terminal yep. emulator. Very well done. Yep. This is familiar to all of us here. <laughs> yeah, so so here we're, we're logged into into CMS, the VM. Mm -hmm. I should be able to do a, you know, a S message. Uh, send a command to um, NCC Max. Uh, say min. So okay. min, min is the one seventy five. So yeah. if we go back to the, the network, Max would work too, or, or should, uh, but it has to hop through the MVS box. Oh, I see. So it takes a second longer. Yeah. Min is directly connected, um, so it might be a little a little quicker to. So now, you know, unfortunately, control data. It looks like didn't really implement uh, you know, the command set that you can you can send to the control data machine isn't probably going to be familiar to us. Yeah, because we use CPKN and stuff like that. Y yeah. Yeah. So you know, I'm thinking you know, uh, there's some enhancements I would like to make, or you know, local modifications I would like to make to the, the <laughs> control data NJE software. Yeah. And one of those might be to implement a compatible command set, so that yeah. you know, we, we can since it can use. CPQ time everywhere, or yeah, exactly. QSYS or whatever. Yeah. So for now, this DU command I'm entering, that's the same as QSYS. Basically. Okay. Oh, RCS now. Oh, oh no, I gotta spell it correctly. RCS, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And is NOS freely downloadable? Um, yeah, so here, here yeah. So yeah. to answer that question quickly, um, it is. So if you're, if you're, uh, so there, again, Tom Hunter and some others created some years ago created a, a site called con controlfreaks.org. Yeah. Uh, one one word. Um, <laughs> C o n t r o l f r e a k s dot yeah. org. Uh, you can join that that site. Now he he managed to acquire um, rights to to. Uh, essentially, uh, redistribute software and documentation. Mm -hmm. um, control data went out of business, so to speak, some years ago. Yep. So the, the actual license holder for the software and the documentation is, believe it or not, British Telecom. Um, yeah. Yeah. And but they but they have said that for hobbyist use, especially, uh, you know, they've no no problems with redistributing software. So. But in order to get access to it, you need to kind of join that community. Yeah, I I have it on the on the on the screen. Yeah. But as far as I know, uh, Tom is quite willing to let anybody join. I don't think there are any really okay. special prerequisites to join, other than being interested. Yeah. So once once you get into that site, um, and, and Tom makes his emulator available to to, uh, to anyone as well, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, so including the, the source code and so on, and. Uh, but once you get into the Control Freak site, you'll find a, a wealth of software and documentation available there. Okay. Um, including many versions of the NOS operating system, versions of other operating systems as well. Okay. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll certainly yep. sign up. Yep. Very interesting. Um, and, okay. Yep. So, so what I just did here was send the equivalent of the QSYS command to the Cyber yeah. 175. Yes. Yeah. We, we can see we it. We can do the same thing. Um, Oh, Special message, RSCS. Yep, and I'll send it to Max this time. So we'll probably see it hop through the, the MVS system. Yep. And for MVS, you use the NJE package from uh, yep. Bob the NJE, the NJE 3.8 package, yep. 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 Amazing work also, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, it's really fun to use this stuff, you know. It's amazing work on the Hercules. Yeah. Um, yeah. Community in general. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, here, yep. so here you see the same sort of QSYS command being sent off to the 865. So in this case, of course, it hops through the MVS system because the 865 is not directly connected to the yeah. to the VM system. Yeah. Um, Very interesting. And I, I, I have done, I've sent similar commands uh, from the 
865 out to the SEVM M1 system I, too, because I mean I've successfully sent from the console of the 865 the CPU yeah. time and the QSYS yeah. command. Yeah, I can see here my machine. It says active, so it thinks the link is up, but it's not up. But uh, huh. yeah. Well, you know that's that's the nature of uh, NJE, right? Um, it's <laughs> is are there still are there still installations worldwide using this architecture today in production? You know that that's a question that gets asked from time to time on that control freaks site. You know, there's a distribution list, an email distribution list that goes along with that control freaks uh, site, mm -hmm. and people have wondered that from time to time. I think the general consensus is there probably aren't aren't any. Uh, actual machines running anymore mm -hmm. but there are emulators that are elsewhere uh you know running and yeah i don't know if it's a commercial way but but uh mm -hmm. um you know the, the the nostalgic computing center here isn't the only site on the web that, that runs uh, emulators for this hardware mm -hmm. as far as we know there probably probably is no longer any hardware running although People have speculated that there may still be some secret sites that could possibly still be running yeah. this hardware. Yeah. There were there used to be stories about uh, control data making you know a a, a you know a, a customer that wasn't let's say very well defined in a way would would order a machine and and the, and mm -hmm. the yeah. and control data was told to, to basically drive a truck with the machine on it to the middle of the desert somewhere and you know, in the <laughs> morning in the morning the machine and truck would be gone yeah um, yeah so so there were there were like I said a lot of spook sites that that uh, had those machines and there's some speculation that possibly you know there's some still running the machines yeah just because there may be software running on them that uh, yeah. For whatever reason, it's easy to port elsewhere. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, the last uh, GE machine running Multics uh, was turned off in the year 2000, 2000 2002, I think. So, um, I've gotten quite a few requests to, to add Multics to this site, and I and that's kind of on the to do list, definitely. Mm. But but one of the one of the things I strive for here in adding machines to the collection is to is to add machines that have some kind of networking capability so that we can communicate between them. And the multi simulator that's available, it's not, it might support some networking, some actually early ARPANET, you know, the, you know, the early hardware that was, that, that was yes. used to, to create the, uh, the very early ARPANET. Yes. That may, that may still be available. Uh, it may, may still be, it might still be possible to get that running on the, on the Multics. I mean, yeah, the but it needs the DP20 uh, front-end uh, communication yeah, yeah. controller, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, the IMP, the IMP concept. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I started to look at that, uh, and I'll probably get back to it at, at, at some point, but it would, it would be, I mean, Multics was a, you know, it's a very iconic machine, our operating system. Of course. And uh, having that in the collection would be... Uh, yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, hugely influential, of course, because of uh, yeah. it was run. It's it was the first, um, like you know, major commercial operating system written yeah. in a high level language in PL1. Yeah, uh, one of the professors, uh, you know, in grad when I was in graduate school, one of the professors in the computer science department was on the Multics team. Oh. And and uh, he liked to tell a story about how the very first time they tried to boot. Multics on the hardware. Mm. It was all, of course, as you said, written in PL1 or, yeah. or a dialect of PL1. Mm -hmm. Said so it, it wouldn't boot because it was bigger than the available physical memory. <laughs> currently on. So yeah. they had, so they had they had to go back to the drawing board and trim it down in order to get it to boot. Yeah. <laughs> Professor Corbato, who was running the Multics effort, uh, just recently passed away in the last uh, six wow. months, I think. Uh, oh. yeah, yeah, hugely influential. Uh, Professor and and, yeah. and and but yeah so I I just want to mention here before we close that you know the, I will make the link to this website available in the description below the video you're watching right now and uh, as you can see uh, the one thing that really picks my interest is the Z80 because it looks yeah. like you may have an async uh, terminal line to the Z80 to run basic well, or something. Well, so the Z80 in this case uh, is actually a. An emulator, you know, a, term, a hardware emulator of the Z80, 
entirely written in JavaScript, so it actually boots inside your web browser. Oh. <laughs> so, so if I, you know, if I bring it up, um, yes, I it's, can it's see actually it. booting now. It's running in the. It's already running. Here you go. It's running. You're familiar with CPM? Yes, I'm just. I just started the word star. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so uh, yeah. So this actually runs in your in your web browser, and and the you know the diagram here. Uh, yes. Is meant to show that that there's sort of this virtual there's this virtual uh, terminal server as part of this yeah. network, and the Z80 is connected to that. So from the Z80, you can run CPM programs like Xmodem, uh, and there's a very simple terminal emulator there, yeah. and so on. That, that allows you to then connect to any of the other machines in the network. So, so when you say we, uh, is that is there more than just you running this amazing network of uh, of, uh, of older machines? No, that, that's an aspirational we, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so it's you. This is my hobby. This is this is one of my major hobbies. Um, yeah. I'm I'm certainly very, um, you know, if if someone wants to join in and participate, I I welcome that too. Yeah, I mean, I run a bunch of machines uh, with production um, with VM370 and MVS because I make some services uh, visible to the users, and yeah. I can tell you it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, it's a lot of work. Every yeah. evening I have to log in, uh, you know, see that everything is running, restart services. People want to have accounts, and so uh, yeah. I can certainly appreciate the amount yeah. of uh, amazing uh, work that you put into this. So yeah, the, the um. And you can see that, yeah, one of the recent additions is to connect, well, not only to add NJE, but actually connect it to HNet. Yeah. Um, we may also, we, I may also connect uh, the DECnet nodes here into this, something called HECnet, which is, yep. you know, kind of like HNet, but yes. DECnet based. I'm on it, yep. Yep. And then I, well, I've also been collaborating or, or communicating with um, with a guy who's implemented a, a you know, Cray supercomputer yes later. Yeah. yeah and uh and we're we, we're in discussions about uh connecting his uh you know internal network to this as well so you you have the ability to submit jobs to cray uh, or, or log in from here into into a cray j90 supercomputer yeah. i i made a video about running that emulator um and this made a lot of progress since uh yeah. but just the history of how this gentleman obtained yeah, yeah. the uh, image of the operating system he had to actually uh, write a magnetic uh, yeah. uh, a, a magnetic sensor for disks to kind of guess what the encoding on the disks were was and then statistically derive the encoding yeah. and then and then <laughs> put together the operating I mean amazing stuff that's going on yeah. in this in, yeah, in this community amazing. yeah and, and, and his name is Andres and yes and, uh, what what we uh, in Hungary? We, yeah, what, yeah. What we what we've uh, started to talk about a little bit. So he actually has software. There's a software called Cray Station Software. Mm -hmm. so, so something like NJE, same kind of you know functionality. Yeah. Really, but but implemented by Cray, and they and they had interfaces to various other kinds of mainframes because you know back in the day you would usually have some kind of a mainframe that was the front end to the Cray supercomputer. Yes. Um, you didn't you didn't log in interactively no. to the Cray supercomputer. Yeah. You submit batch jobs to it and yeah. so this Cray station software was was kind of like NJE. That's what enabled you to link your yeah. IBM mainframe or your control data mainframe or your VAX yeah. to the to the Cray supercomputer. Yeah. And, and he has that so he's got he's got he's got the source code to to for that, the, for the MBS station, I think the VM station, the control data station. Yes. So we've talked about the possibility of trying to get that working as well. Oh, that would be amazing. I mean, yes, it's true. The Cray uh, machines, people think it was a there was a whole computer. No, it was really just there, just for the computation, and people yeah. would send. Uh, we would it would just take computation, do it, and then return, and not not know anything about file system or any other thing. It would just return the yeah. results. And then there was a front end processor taking those results and formatting it, and people would work would would log in to those front end processes, right? Which yeah. is kind of the idea that you mentioned before of the CDC, where the you know even the operating system would try not to run on the on the central processors; it would yeah. run on those on those peripheral CPUs. Yep. Yeah. yeah. 
and of course uh, Seymour Cray, Seymour Cray being the same person behind it, who also yeah. just recently passed away. I think. Uh, well, he he, eight he years. unfortunately died in the nineties. Oh, in the nineties. Okay. Tra tra tragic car accident. In oh, in the nineties. Did you did you know him? I one of my good friends and it was one of his nieces. <laughs> okay. And so, she worked at she worked at Control Data when I was at Control Data. Okay. Oh, so you were actually at CDC. You worked at CDC. Yeah, so I, I yeah, I guess we didn't fill in the blanks there. But yeah, I, I, I worked at the University of Massachusetts for a number of years in the computing center there. And because of our strong contacts with the vendor, Control Data, I knew people there and ended up moving to Minnesota and uh, worked uh, for Control Data for, for uh, more than 10 years. At, in uh, St. Paul? Before, before moving on, yeah. At the St. Paul site? Well, yeah, I was in the what they call Twin Cities. It was actually in a, a city called Arden Hills, okay. which is where 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 the where the Florida supercomputers and many of them were actually manufactured. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Well, this has been an amazing session for all of us. Uh, I will also point to a book that exists about the history of CDC. But anyway, this has been this has been amazing. I learned a lot. I I I'm in awe uh, of what you have accomplished here with the Nostalgia Computer Center. And again, it's going to be linked in the description below this video. And at this point, I just want to thank you, Kevin, for your for your patience and for uh, and for uh, giving us um, a taste of CDC in this channel. It's been great fun, and I hope to keep up our collaboration. Thank you very much, Kevin. I'll see you on HNet. You bye bye.